Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I was actually barred from coming up here, but um, I hope you'll lend me your ears. We need a revolution in funding to eradicate tuberculosis. We call on the Global Fund and partners to increase the, fu the amount of funds allocated to tuberculosis by $2.9 billion per year without jeopardizing funding to HIV and malaria and other diseases. The increase of funds will contribute to ensuring that the current tuberculosis tools are used efficiently and effectively to combat TB. In addition, the funds will secure research and development of more efficacious drugs and treatment regimens that are well tolerated and patient friendly. We anticipate that increased funding will enable the development of rapid and reliable TB diagnostic tools that can easily be used in low resource settings, particularly in the African region. We hope that the funds will also jumpstart TB national programs to collaborate with social welfare departments so that social enablers are provided during TB treatment, since TB disproportionately affects the poor, who often have limited access to nutritional, water, nutritional food, water, and transportation, all of which are necessary for treatment adherence. We envision that the funds will adequately cover access to TB treatment and care for key population groups, including those infected with MDR-TB. If we do not treat all, we cannot end it all. Selective treatment of patients is a violation of human rights and a burden on the public health system, which should not be tolerated. We urge the Global Fund to rethink its funding allocation to a needs-based allocation as opposed to World Bank economic classification of countries into lower, middle, and upper income. Middle income countries disproportionately bear the burden of TB, are home to large numbers of poor people, and often have health budgets similar to those of low income countries. The exit of Global Fund from Eastern Europe and Central Asia due to the middle income status, a region with a high MDR-TB burden will severely affect MDR-TB patients and increase MDR-TB incidence since country budgets in this region have not increased to fill the Global Fund gap. We urge the Global Fund to raise more funds for TB and encourage partners, including the private sector, as well as the financial institutions, to fund tuberculosis. Our message is simple. We want a bigger slice of the cake for TB shouldn't detract from important work being done on HIV and malaria. Instead, we need a bigger cake to fight all three diseases. Thank you. No, thank you. I'm on diet. <laughs> thank you. Um, we do need more money for TB, but we need to do a lot more than that. I will, just to clarify, we are not pulling out of Eastern Europe. We actually have more money in Eastern Europe than we had for the last three years, over the next three years. Uh, but funding is constrained. Um, our entire budget for all three diseases for uh, each year is $4 billion. Uh, so, uh, but, and it's the countries who are leading, and we'll talk about that. So, Honorable Minister, thank you for uh, your leadership uh, in just the last four and a half months, and we know you'll do what you did uh, with TB, what you did with polio. So uh, it's a great privilege to be on the stage with you and the other panelists. Uh, the topic of this first talk is uh, defeating TB, and it's about a paradigm shift and how we can use the money we have, understanding that we need more, uh, better, smarter, and to achieve goals. Um, before we start, we want to begin by thanking people who have devoted their lives to the fight against TB, including the uh, wonderful people who were just up here demanding more money, and in particular, the partners who participate in this uh, presentation, Stop TB Partnership, UNAIDS, WHO, and advocates and activists. So where are we today before we talk about where we're trying to get to and what we're trying to achieve? So this is the current um, projections, which I think many of you are aware of. Um, if we are on the current path, we are, have a decline in, HIV, in um, TB rates of 1.5% per year right now, 1.5% per year. That doesn't put us on a very good pathway uh, to achieve TB elimination and TB uh, control. If we optimize the tools we have, we can actually bend that curve down pretty considerably according to models, and then if we have a vaccine and other prophylaxis, go down even further. I think these estimates are still way too conservative. Uh, this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. So we do need better drugs. Uh, we need shorter duration uh, for a cure. We need less tox drugs. We need a vaccine. We need more resources. But we don't have to start from there. We can start with what we have. 
We actually have for tuberculosis, something we don't have, for example, for HIV, curative therapy in six months, and soon very likely curative therapy in three months. Imagine if HIV had a tr curative treatment in six months or three months. Do you think we would be accepting a 1.5% decline in infection rates per year? Probably not. Will we accept declining in TB, TB rates and trying to get to eradication in 2030? Probably not. We would be demanding that we get the treatment out effectively, use the money that we have, get more money, and end the epidemic. So why, with six-month curative therapy and soon three months curative therapy, are we talking about 1.5% declines or even 20, 20, 35 declines? And we do need more money. But let's look at the numbers and see how we're going to advocate for that. So right now there's about $6.3 billion a year for tuberculosis. $5.3 billion of it comes from countries themselves, like India. Um, and we do need more money. But we are saying we need an extra $2 billion per year, or $2.9 billion a year. That's a 25% increase. How are any of us going to go to a policymaker and say, we need a 25% increase because we'll go then from 1.5% decline per year to 90% decline per year, or 70%. That math doesn't add up. 25% increase in resources to go to one, from 1.5% to go to 70, 90%. Obviously, we could use the resources or have to be using the resources better if any of this math is to add up. Add up. No one is going to be advocated for an extra $2 billion or 25% increase if all we have with the 80% of funding is a 1.6% or 1.5% decline in infection rates. So how do we use the money smarter, better, and uh, get results? better results. Through data-driven interventions and focusing on hotspots is one starting point, and there are a couple of starting points. So you all know the numbers. There are an estimated 9 million cases per year. We identify 5.7 million, so we're 3 million short. We need to get to those cases, and we certainly need to deal with the cases of new MDR-TB. So where are those cases? Well, they're concentrated in a number of countries. They're not all over the place. There is TB in many, many countries, but the proportion of the people we're missing are in a relatively small number of countries. And you can go much deeper than just the countries. You can go within the countries. You can go to where the new infections are occurring. This is from Cambodia, but you'd see it almost anywhere. You don't have to go everywhere in the country. You go where the new infections are occurring, which are the blue spots. And in the case of Cambodia, it happens to be highly related to poverty. And even in middle-income countries and upper-middle-income countries, there are people left behind, which we'll come to in a moment. MDR cases are similar, which you can see in the red spots. You don't have to go everywhere. You have to go where the new infections are and if you go where the new infections are your resources go a lot further but it's not just geographies it's people and this is one of the problems with some infectious diseases like tuberculosis HIV and others that disproportionately affect marginalized groups some of those groups include mining t migrant miners in southern Africa. It's estimated that almost 33% or a third of new TB cases in, sub in deep southern Africa uh, come from migratory miners. What happens, as you know, is they go to, from one mine in one country in one regimen, they go home, sometimes to two different homes, they stop their drugs, then they go to another mine in another country and start new drugs because there's a different regimen, and they repeat that pattern, which leads to spread of TB and MDR-TB. So it's going to require a cross-country cross approach focusing on people we don't often focus on, <coughs> migratory workers from one country to another. Prisons, you all know the data, and correctional facilities. High rates of tuberculosis in correctional facilities, five to 70 times higher than the general population. And it's important to support programs that get into correctional facilities, uh, as, for example, South Africa is now doing. People who inject drugs are a very affected group in Eastern Europe, also a marginalized population left behind. So as we're increasingly trying to do an HIV, TB can start focusing its resources in the geographies where new infections are occurring and in the populations, particularly the marginalized populations where infections are occurring, if we're going to be able to get to the people, those three million cases that are missed per year, in addition effectively to get to the cases that we can identify. 
Now, we're not going to get to any of those groups if we see health ending at a facility, which was one of the important conversations we wanted to have in this session, which is tying the community and community-based solutions, because you're not going to get to marginalized groups. You're not going to get in the communities where those three million people are unless you engage deeply with the community and with the people in the community. And there are some very exciting solutions that are pretty low cost that will help us get there. One of the more interesting and exciting ones is sponsored by the Stop TB Partnership, an awesome group, and Luchika has done as much as anyone to get TB on the radar uh, of the world. Uh, and they've done a lot of innovative approaches to try to reach those three million, and not only reach them, but to get them and keep them in services. And I want to show you some examples of the innovative work that's being done with different groups. In remote rural Ethiopia, in the Sadama zone, uh, the government of Ethiopia, with support from uh, many partners, including the Global Fund, has developed an extensive health extension <laughs> network that actually gets two community health care workers per every village throughout Ethiopia. And through TB Reach, uh, they increase the knowledge of and use the extension workers to get into the homes, get into the deep parts of the community and the rural community to reach the people uh, that they needed to get to. And when they did this, they saw a doubling uh, of the case detection by using these extension workers, by getting into the community. This is a government supported program with official uh, healthcare workers, but you don't always have to do that. In Karachi, in urban Karachi, where there's a high rate of, of TB infection, uh, and this is, occurs, as you know, in middle-income countries like Pakistan, the private sector is an area you have to get to. And in the urban areas, Stop TB and TB Reach is using private practitioners in Karachi to reach uh, the people uh, and to have better services provided to them. This led to a 79% increase in TB detection case from the previ previous year, a 79% increase. Both of these programs are very low cost. And here you just, can just see that graphically. This is a fascinating program in Nigeria uh, that's trying to track nomads. And to track the nomads, it was necessary to work with tribal leaders. And so in Nigeria, TB Reach uh, used the network of community volunteers and the tribal leaders to encourage that uh, to use, to, again, get into the community and get to uh, people who otherwise weren't reached. And they identified 1,300 cases and were able to um, increase detection by 50%. And it's important to note that the nomads accounted for 31% of lab confirmed notifications in the state as a result of this program. So again, using the community and using community leaders, in this case tribal leaders, in a novel way to get to people. And then from Kuala Zulu Natal, TB HIV Care Association, again with TB Reach, uh, went into the rural areas and again used uh, teams, mobile teams, uh, that would routinely screen for TB and collect sputum uh, with community health facilitators using community programs. And these community workers screened for TB, collected sputum, recalled the patients uh, with, with, um, ex, with gene expert positivity. Uh, they screened their contacts, referred the children for IPT, and they provided adherence support. So a whole package. And Harry's here in the audience and uh, led this program. They saw a 61 increase in bacteriological confirmed TB cases, uh, which is extraordinary. Uh, this is in a six-month period that they achieved these results. And the T, uh, TB treatment uh, initiation, uh, the time from initiation uh, of treatment decreased um, to a number of days and had significant increase in cure rates from 44% to 85%. This is in six months with community outreach programs. That's the type of thing you can see. It's smarter, better use of money that gets to the people in need. Another approach that is essential and has begun uh, in many places is integration of TB and HIV. As you all know, there are 44 countries around the world that have high co-infection rates. South Africa, the minister from South Africa was here, uh, and it's extraordinary to have min the ministers of health from India and South Africa at this conference and highlighting the need for addressing TB in their countries. And the minister from South Africa has taken this very seriously and is going after communities as just like the minister from India. 80% of HIV deaths in, in South Africa are from tuberculosis. 
you know, when I was at the tuberculosis, whenever I'm at speaking at an HIV meeting, I always point out that you cannot talk about HIV, at least in sub-Saharan Africa, unless you talk about tuberculosis. It's one disease in many places. And at TB meetings, we should be saying the same thing. We cannot address global tuberculosis unless we deal with HIV as well, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. But every country is very different, and the overlaps are not always there. As the minister in South Africa pointed out, yes, in Kuala Zulu Natal, HIV and TB are one disease in the same person. But in the Western Cape, which has the lowest rate of HIV, they have the highest rate of tuberculosis. So you have to be not only country specific in your design of programs and outreach, we have to be district by district specific and really go where the new infections are and understand the drivers of the TB infections and in the case of parts of sub-Saharan Africa especially that means dealing with TB HIV. In Eastern Europe uh, TB and HIV are linked in many people who inject drugs, but that's not the case in many other communities in Eastern Europe. So we have to be that refined in our understanding. There is no such thing as a global tuberculosis epidemic. There's not even a national tuberculosis epidemic. There are district by district, community by community epidemics, and, and unless we understand and get to them, we can't effectively use the money we have to see the rates come down so that we can advocate for more. In that regard, the Global Fund has now moved in those 44 countries to require a single concept note for TB and HIV explaining where the infections are occurring, how, and how to integrate programs. It's been difficult, uh, but it's actually going much better than expected, and countries are really moving uh, in this direction. Some countries had actually done it before uh, the required note. Stop TB estimates that 1.5 million lives were saved over a six-year period by integrating TB and HIV programs, with a 25-fold increase in cases detected and double detection and treatment. That's pretty impressive. That's a good use of resource. That's a good, good strategic use of resource. It's understanding the epidemics and where they are. So how do we get to 2020 and bend that curve from the 1.5% down to something remarkable, more remarkable that will allow us to advocate for more funds? It requires a paradigm shift, a shift in thinking to move from coverage rates and control to elimination, uh, to ending an epidemic. It means using data-driven interventions focusing on hotspots. It means investing for impact and focusing on vulnerable groups, including the people who are most affected by tuberculosis. It means an innovation solutions like joining TB and HIV in concept notes and in thinking and TB reach projects that get into the community and double case detection rates and cure rates in a six month period at very low cost. It means looking country by country, region by region, district by district and using every tool we have so that we can push the curve down. Now models don't show that we can push the curve down this far. Uh, but models have historically been fairly conservative. Uh, I wonder, I should not say this in a room of experts, but a former uh, UK Prime Minister once said, if experience and history has taught us anything, it's don't trust the experts. Now, I'm an expert myself, uh, and the, we as experts are trained to doubt. We're, doubt. we're taught to challenge, to be suspicious. And we should be, and you need to challenge, and you need to doubt, but we also need to be ambitious and look to something extraordinary. When the minister from, minister, uh, from India first addressed polio not long ago, he was told it couldn't be achieved, and he moved to immunizing the entire country and eliminating uh, polio, despite everyone saying it was impossible. In HIV, when we began 13 years ago, we were told that it would be impossible to get more than a few hundred thousand people in antiretroviral therapy in low and middle income countries. We're now at 13 million. Models don't tell the future if we use money well, if we are strategic, and if we focus. And we know this is the case. So you all know public health well, and you know that we've only eradicated two infectious diseases from the planet. One, smallpox, a human disease. Another, rinderpest, which is actually a zoonotic disease. They both went through a very difficult period where the initial thinking and the common public health approach was coverage rates. Increase your coverage rates, focus on control. And it was a shift in mindset. It was a shift in thinking from we shouldn't just be controlling, we should be ending. And that mindset directs you in a very different path than if you're trying to control, if you're trying to increase coverage rates. And if we use the resources we have today, that six, more than $6 billion a year that we have, with 
curative therapy in six months and soon to be three months, we should be much more ambitious than even trying to move towards 2035. We have the opportunity and if we have success and if we bend the curves, we will gain resource. That is a key lesson learned of the last 12 years. If you show results, you will get more money. If you have a 1.3% decline in new infections and actually an increase in number of cases of TB because of growing population, with $6.3 billion, it's very difficult to advocate for a 25% increase. <laughs> so we need to change how we do things. So the question in our mind is not can we end the TB epidemic, the only question is will we? Will we change our mindset, will we focus on ending, and will we use the money we have strategically to support countries to achieve those objectives district by district, population by population, or will we continue on the current path? That's for us to decide. Thank you. So for me, it's a great honor to, to introduce uh, somebody that must not be introduced at all, which is uh, uh, Professor Stefan Kaufman that uh, he has led the, the TB field in TB research and knowledge about pathogenesis uh, for a long time. Um, through the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, which is in the place that uh, Robert Koch uh, made also uh, his discovery. So um, please, Stefan Kaufman, go to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, and thanks for your interest in both how to get the money to solve the problem and change our mind, as we just heard, but also your interest in how there could be a reciprocity between clinical studies and basic research, and that's more or less what I would like to talk to you about in the next uh, couple of minutes with the example of um, vaccine development. Let me just have my faculty disclosure. I have been and or am advisor for ERAS, TB Alliance, EDCTP, all non-for-profit, advisor for Quietgen, a company, and I'm inventor of a TB vaccine about which I will talk in more detail. TB has been with Europe over the last thousands of years. And for about thousand years, actually, if we believe the contemporary writers, there was a cure. The first one to perform this cure was King Clovis by performing the royal touch in the fifth, fifth century, actually. And the most successful cure ever happened when Louis XIII, at the age of 10, cured more than a thousand people at least that's what we learn from the writers of those times. Unfortunately, there must be something wrong because this king actually died of tuberculosis ultimately. <laughs> Yet, all these cases more or less were scrofulosis, which we don't talk about much anymore because it's a rare disease. So it's interesting that in about 800 years ago, someone from Catalonia already took a scientific approach, Arnaldus de Villanova, who claimed that these visible scrofulosa, scrofulas, you know, these swollen lymph nodes, actually indicate that we have similar lesions in our body, like tuberculosis patients have them in their lungs. Now, science breakthroughs really came then in 1882, when Robert Koch describe the etiology of tuberculosis. For many, Robert Koch is the germ hunter in the world, and that's true. He not only discovered the etiology of tu tuberculosis, also the etiology of wound infections, which was quite complicated because there were never several different agents, the etiology of anthrax and the etiology of cholera. But he was much more. He was the one who clarified that it's a contagion, a small microbe that causes disease, not a miasm that kind of, like gases, is around in the world. 
He showed that the organisms are clonal, single clones, and that they are invariable. He showed then that they are exogenous invaders, not like cancer, something went wrong with the host cells and then formulated the three Koch postulates, which I will not discuss in more detail. And finally, actually also, he developed the public health measures to, um, uh, to prevent diseases like cholera, something that's very important currently in the, uh, in the view of the Ebola crisis. Now let me now talk a little bit, very simplified scheme about immunology because vaccinology has a lot to do with immunology. Pathogens enter the host, they enter the lung, and T cells will be stimulated by those cells that engulf them, namely macrophages and dendritic cells, and it is both CD4 and CD8 T cells that develop into effector T cells. But importantly, they also have to become memory T cells to continue protect a state of protection over years, over decades. And so granulomas develop in the lung, develop in the lung, which are composed of T lymphocytes of different types, of macrophages, phagocytes, and they contain the bacteria. And it is this containment that underlies latent tuberculosis. You are infected, but you are healthy. At a later stage, under regulation in the lower part, actually then something goes wrong. It only goes wrong in a couple of percent of the people, 5% or so, who are infected, but that's enough for the 9 million cases to develop annually. So it's either endogenous regulation, which causes a breakdown of the immune system, or it's co-infection, notably HIV, and that then leads to a caseation of the granuloma, dissemination of the pathogen. The patient is diseased, obviously, active TB has developed, and the patient is also contagious. Other people can be infected. Let us look at the vaccines that are currently on the pi in the pipeline. First, we have pre-exposure vaccines which aim to prevent TB given before infection and then keeping a protective immune response, sustaining a protective immune response as long as possible. Very similar are the post-exposure vaccines, but they are given after infection to adolescents or adults and then again attempt to prevent infection. And finally, there are a couple of therapeutic candidates to cure TB. One of them has been developed by our chair, Cardona uh, uh, um, uh, Ruti. I will not go actually into all the details of the different vaccine candidates. Mind you, they are all candidates. They have not succeeded in having proven that they are what we want them to do, namely protective vaccines, preventive vaccines. So let me repeat, there are vaccines that can be, are given pre-exposure, prior to infection. They only prevent disease in the ideal case. Ideally, but later, we would then even want to prevent infection. Then there are post-exposure vaccines, again, prevention of disease, ideally one day eradication, and finally, cure of disease. Let me now explain on one example how we try to harness science to develop a vaccine uh, that ultimately also entered the clinical trials and is quite advanced now in a phase two trial. And that's a recombinant BCG based on BCG that was changed by recombinant technologies to be a more immunogenic and safer vaccine candidate. BCG is localized after it has been phagocytosed in the uh, vacuoles of macrophages. Now in these macrophages, BCG secretes antigen, CD4 T cells are stimulated, and um, that's it. TB, <coughs> however, egresses into the cytosol, and therefore CD8 T cells are stimulated as well. And therefore we thought that we should endow BCG with the capacity to be more immunogenic in stimulating both CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. And what we did is we learned a lesson from another microorganism, Listeria monocytogenes, which produces Listeria lysine that does indeed, that does indeed perforate the membrane and therefore allow activation not only of CD4 but also CD8 T cells. So we now have a BCG, sorry, we now have a BCG that expresses Listeria lysine and therefore stimulates 
CD4, CD8 T cells by different me mechanisms, antigen aggression into the cytosol, but also cross priming. And more recently, we saw that this leads to the stimulation of CD8 T cells, but also of CD4 T cells of different type, namely TH1 cells, the mediators of protection according to canonical thinking, but also TH17 cells. More recently, we found actually that autophagy seems to be a central mechanism because perforation of the membrane allows aggression of uh, double-stranded nucleic acids, DNA, into the cytosol, which is sensed by an inflammasome, but also sensed by sting, and therefore leads to a very profound immunostimulatory milieu that allows for CD4, CD8 T cell stimulation. So for, for T cell priming, what, as I said before, and which is gaining increasing interest, what we want is memory to have a sustained protective immune response. Now there are three types of memory T cells as immunology taught us over the last years, and this is T effector memory or TEM, T central memory, these T central memory, and finally also T resident memory cells. And the resident memory cells, as you see, are localized in the lung as resident memory cells, so are probably activated, but inadequately by TB, but they are not activated by vaccines that are given, that are given through the um, subcutaneous or intradermal route. So what you really want is a central or effector memory cell that then later turns into a resident memory cell. I'm not going into details, but through a lot of uh, studies um, uh, employing a lot of modern um, immunophenotyping, we can show that central memory cells indeed are induced by the recombinant BCG to a much better and higher level than by BCG, as you see in the circle. And most importantly, very few, very few of these central memory T cells are indeed sufficient to confer protection. Now, these are central memory T cells of one single specificity for an epitope of antigen 85B, one of the major empty tuberculosis antigens, and these T cells by themselves. I'm not saying that these T cells that are the final memory cells, but it looks like that these cells can migrate to the lung where they then induce protective immunity. Now, where are we in the development pipeline? Our vaccine is efficient and safe, and that has been shown in a number of preclinical models, protects against the lab strain, and in the notorious clinical isolate of the Be Beijing phenotype, it has been shown to be safe, and it could be produced under GMP conditions, worldwide license to vaccine project management, and most recently has been sub-licensed to, no, to the largest vaccine producers by doses in the world, the Serum Institute India. So so this is the kind of connection from Europe to India. In the past, it was often other way around, and I think that's an important step for us, clearly. It has passed successfully a phase one trial in Germany, then a phase one trial for safety and immunogenicity in South Africa, has passed successfully a phase 2A trial in South Africa in newborn, the target population for this type of vaccine, and has been submitted for a second phase two trial in a large group of newborn of both HIV positive and HIV negative mothers. Prevention of active, active TB, that's really good if it works, and we and other vaccine candidates aim at that, but can we do better? So we try to improve the vaccine by kind of basic research. And the first, I will show you that we can improve this vaccine to be more immunogenic. So what we did here is, based on our ideas that apoptosis and autophagy are important for immunogenicity, we deleted an anti-apoptotic, anti-autophagic molecule, better say gene, within the BCG, recombinant BCG, and that's the new OG. Again, I don't go into details. What I show you here is that indeed, in red, you see our VPM, our strain that's in clinical trials, and then you see that we can further improve vaccination against um, TB and also against the clinical isolate Beijing W and the lower part on the lower part within that circle. Second, we want to get that vaccine safer. After all, we would like to apply it into HIV-positive individuals, and there it should be as safe as possible. So what we did here is delete the vaccine of its capacity 
to produce vitamin B6. Vitamin, as it says by name, vitamin B6 is one of the vitamins that are essential for the human body. It's not essential for mycobacterium tuberculosis. It can does it by, do it by, yourself, by itself. However, by depleting PDX, it can't do that anymore, and therefore it will die out in a vaccine. And what you see here, if you go a, give a high dose in an immunocompromised mouse, then you will see that the mouse dies of BCG. You see here that our vaccine, which is in clinical trials, already much safer because the mice survive 500 days, but in addition, depletion of vitamin, vitamin B6 uh, synthesis, you get a further improvement, and the mice die until they die of a normal lifespan, and therefore this is interesting. Now, this vaccine actually, as I said, is safer. It's as good as BCG, but it lost the additional vaccine efficacy that is given by VPM and by the newer G deletion, so it is as good as BCG, but much safer than all the others. So you may consider two different vaccines for two different purposes. Purposes. Finally, I would like to very briefly mention the last approach is, and that is to endow BCG with more anti uh, higher antigenic repertoire. Let's look at the lesion. What you see here on the left is a solid granuloma as we see it in LTBI, in healthy individuals infected. Bacteria are controlled, they are dormant, and they produce antigens and genes expressed in genes which are typical for a dormant bacteria. During active disease, however, the mycobacteria are active, they produce different kinds of gene products because they now are metabolically active and replicative. So what we have to consider is that somehow MTB, like many parasites, lives in two different stages. Dormant stage, quiescent, active stage, more or less active. That's important for TB vaccines because it reflects different stages and different antigens. In the solid granuloma, you need dormancy antigens of a quiescent MTB. Active TB, however, is characterized by active antigens. Now, BCG doesn't really express the dormant and dormancy antigens, and therefore we thought we put in the genes in a higher expression system. Actually, the genes are there, but you need to express them in a higher way. So what we did here, we did that, uh, and what you see here, indeed, by endowing them with a number of dormancy antigens, we can further improve protection. So let me say it again. What we have now is candidates like ours and several others that attempt to prevent <coughs> TB disease. BCG does that in principle, but it delays TB only. That is, one day TB can break out in a child uh, which was protected over a couple of years. So the first generation wants to prevent TB disease. However, what we really would like to see is a vaccine that either prevents infection so that you never get the microorganism stably infected in your lung, that, now, that latent TB does not develop, or a vaccine that in someone who is already infected eradicates the pathogen. That's a long way to go. And I think the only way to go there is to have both translation and reverse translation. Now in translational studies, as you know very well, what we do is we do basic research, targeted research, and then try to have a product that goes into clinical trial. And I think that, you saw that slide before, that basic research in the last years has offered an enormous amount and abundance of interesting studies from immunology mostly that can be integrated in our way of thinking to further improve a BCG vaccine. I'm not going into detail just to give you a flavor. What we now know that antibodies that could prevent infection could, I said, are interesting. We know that there are different lymphoid cells, like mate cells, innate lymphoid cells that could contribute to protection. There are non-canonical T cells, like the CD1 restricted T cells, the gamma delta T cells, that could help us to further improve protective immunity. Then, of course, we need the right memory T cells. I focused on the central memory cells, and we will see one day how to stimulate by a vaccine uh, to stimulate um, lung resident memory T cells. And finally, we also have to live with the negative influence, that is the regulatory T cells, regulatory myeloid uh, cells, and regulatory B cells. Now, this is just a flavor from basic research in a way from translation into, into product development. Equally important, and that has been ignored by many of us who are working in the basic research field over decades, is reverse translation. But we are now ready to learn from clinical studies, from clinical trials, 
be it drug trials, be it vaccine trials, or be it following up observational studies on TB patients, comparing them with biomarkers, for example, <coughs> against latently infected uh, individuals. What we have to kind of learn now is that such clinical trials should be more than the assessment of a single vaccine or a single drug. It should also be used as a guide for future drugs or vaccines in our case. So we need biobanks, we need state-of-the-art analysis. I know that costs more money and is not always in the sense of the vaccine developer perhaps. It needs a lot of uh, bioinformatics to see how do those people differ who are protected from those who are not protected. And obviously we need transparency and readiness to share data because some other vaccine developer may learn from such a clinical trial for the future. So what we really want is an iterative approach between basic research to generate knowledge and clinical studies to generate uh, accelerated product development. I'm convinced it will only work if both go together and try to get the information exchange, even if sometimes we speak very different languages. Let me very briefly state uh, the contributors to the few slides I showed on research from my department. Martin Gengenbacher, who is now in Singapore, Steve Rees, who left for a company, Alexis Vogelsang from Australia, and Hiroyuki Saika from Japan, all worked on the studies which I mentioned very briefly in the basic lab. We get a lot of collaboration um, with the um, vaccine clinical trial team, Leander Grode, Band Eisler, from Germany, Mark Cotton, Anneke Hesseling, and their colleagues from um, Stellenbosch University. And although I didn't mention the work of the um, Grand Challenge Program on biomarkers, I would like to thank the whole GC6 team as well. Now, every day I go to this institute, I pass here the barracks where Robert Koch did his clinical trials, and here he did his uh, studies on the development of tuberculosis and the etiology of tuberculosis. And there's one other place. The building is no longer there, but this is the building that really was the hot spot of science 100 years ago. This is where Robert Koch did his studies after the discovery of TB. This is the place where his disciples, Emil von Behring and Paul Ehrlich, did their work. They all got the Nobel Prize, Robert Koch in 1905, Emil Behring was the first ever to receive the Nobel Prize in 1901, and Paul Ehrlich the Nobel Prize in 1908, together with Elie Metchnikov. Now that institute was built and created because at those times, people believed that science can contribute, can contribute to the development of intervention measures against diseases uh, like TB. It was simple, similarly done also at the Pasteur Institute, where, as I said before, Mechnikov, Eli Mechnikov, could do basic research because an institute had been created of, because of the success of Louis Pasteur's research studies on infectious diseases. So I think it's really time to pay back uh, for basic research to uh, TB, because normally we think basic research drives development of intervention measures, but in that case, really, success in clinical studies had driven, had driven basic research. And with this, let me come to an end. Let me thank the DZK and, of course, the Union for supporting the Robert Koch Lecture, and thank you so much for your attention. To, to wrap up the session, um, the Honorable, we're very privileged to have the Honorable Minister of Health from India. Uh, he's a rare public health leader. He knows how to set vision, uh, but then he also knows how to achieve it, as he did in uh, setting the pace for eradicating polio in India. Uh, and it's a great honor to have him here again, uh, uh, the Honorable Minister Harsh Bardhan of India. My colleagues on the dais and dear friends, first of all, this lecture is dedicated to the memory of Robert Koch. So uh, I pay my humble tributes to his great memory and congratulate both the speakers for their great presentation and wish Dr. Kaufman 
good success. Uh, he'll get us a good vaccine very soon, and we'll be able to conquer tuberculosis uh, much faster now. <coughs> you see, this whole lecture was about <coughs> two, three things, as I could understand. <coughs> One was the optimum utilization of the money, and the other was the better involvement of the community, and then, of course, uh, our distinguished scientist he spoke about the development of the vaccine and its history. Over the years, I have believed that uh, one thing that is very critical to the success of a program, the other day I mentioned about <coughs> the power of belief, the power of evidence, the power of communication, etc. But over and above all these powers, the most important power is the <coughs> power of motivation. And I have experienced over the years that if we can utilize this power to basically awaken the God inside every man, there is an inherent goodness in everybody. Howsoever worse a person may be, but he has that inherent goodness in him. And there is a God inside everybody. If we can awaken that God and actually motivate the person. And when you talk about the person, it is not, a, not an individual in the community. I have a large number of examples which I have experienced myself <coughs> from the polio eradication campaign. Where a meeting with a single individual for half an hour convincing him about the plight of millions of children who get paralyzed because of the polio, I was able to convince the gentleman to give us advertisements worth 63 crores on his television for five years without even charging 63 paisa. A meeting with a police commissioner for 20 minutes could motivate him to put all his 52,000 police constables on the job. And on the day of the pulse polio immunization, these constables were not actually looking after the routine job that they were supposed to be doing. They were picking up children from the homes of the poor people and taking them to the polio kendra. And they dedicated all their communication channel, that's 100, only for the people of the city to communicate if there is a vaccine shortage anywhere, you call there on that 100 and the message will be transmitted. So all their system was basically transferred back to us. A single meeting with a director of education for an hour to explain could motivate him and get him into the act of mobilizing two million school children who were assigned a homework to go back to the community, write the names of ten young, less than three-year-old children on their notebook, bring them back to the teacher, show those names there, and on the immunization day, ask the mother of these children uh, to take these children to the polio kendra. And this small meeting with the motivational effort and a technical input helped us in having children in our system. I remember 20 years back a child who brought 346 children to the polio kendra. And this is not one such example, a meeting with a senior head of the mosque, he, when he got convinced, he mobilized 3,000 mosques for us. A meeting with a temple man got us 300 temples into the whole program. A meeting with a man from Gurdwara got us 516 Gurdwaras into the program. I am giving you all these examples just to say that unfortunately our tuberculosis program 
had two handicaps. Number one, it is a program which, in fact, uh, the, it is a disease which mostly affects poor people. They don't have the voice like the voice we heard when the whole world was getting affected by HIV. But I was so happy to see these young women. They have at least started shouting about tuberculosis now, whether it is funds or anything else. And the other bad thing is that the rich people, if they get tuberculosis, they think that they, they can't have tuberculosis. And that is why the program keeps suffering. I strongly feel that there is a need for all of us now to go back to our own countries and think of innovative ways whereby we can ensure that these three million people who are missed as per the WHO report, when we come back here after one year, then not a single person all over the world should at least be missed. And once they are detected, then it is not only the money that we have through our global fund or our country fund, but look at the money which others also have. It is only your power of communication and it is your power of motivating them which can help them give that money also for the care of the tuberculosis patients. It is not a very tall order that I am talking about. Whatever I, have, I am talking about is what we have done, what we have been able to successfully show. And this is what we are going to do in tuberculosis also. I promise that we would like to make tuberculosis movement one of the biggest social movements in health in the coming years. We need your support and I am sure you people are very, very committed people because the very fact that when people, people love to go for the conferences of coronary artery diseases, they love to go for the conferences on diabetes and endocrinology and so many neurological neurotraumas, etc., etc., there are still people for 94 years who are coming to this union for the cause of tuberculosis and in the last three days, I have seen that people who come here, they have the sincerity in the, at the core of their heart. They have the potential to develop a killer instinct to eliminate tuberculosis from the face of the world. And this is that uh, zeal with which I would request all of you to go back. And I think Mark and uh, Dr. Hoffman has very clearly told us that we have the way, we have the mechanism, we have the strategy, and our dream cannot remain unfulfilled. I'm sure you will go back with a new enthusiasm, and all these developments, all these uh, deliberations that have taken place in this conference, they will not go waste. They will not become part of an academic history of another chapter added to the 94 years history of the union. By the time you come in 2020 for the celebration of the, you can say, centenary of the union, each one of you should have a very credible record in your pocket that this is something very concrete, measurable and perceptible that we have added to the success story of tuberculosis elimination. I wish you all good success and once again congratulate both the distinguished speakers who made a very fine presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your assistance. Thank you. Okay.